Okay, great. We are live. Connection looks good. So I guess we can start. Okay, great. So hi, everyone. Welcome to the Foreman community demo. I'm Nafar. I'm a Foreman developer, and I'll be your host for today's demo. Uh, today, we have some updates to share with you about our last release and some new things we've been working on. But before we get started, this demo is all about showing you the latest updates and answering any questions you might have. So we want to hear from you. To make this as interactive as possible, feel free to ask questions and share your thoughts with us. You can do that, you can do that in two ways, by posting your questions and comments on IRC at the foreman or by using the YouTube live chat feature. We'll be monitoring both channels throughout the demo, so don't hesitate to speak up. Okay. Let's have a quick look at the, the agenda we have for today. By the way, if you can see or hear or anything, please let me know. But on my side, everything looks good. Okay, um, so the agenda for today's demo, um, as you can see, we have a lot of um, Cactello presenters uh, showing some new features for today, two from Jeremy, one from Ian, uh, two from Lucy, two from Samir, and then a poll that Gurija uh, will uh, present. Uh, yeah, I guess we can start with Jeremy. First topic about content view, uh, LCE change UI improvement. Uh, so Jeremy, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Nafar. I will share my screen. Let me know if you can't see anything or if you can't hear me. Uh, but OK, hey, everyone. I'm Jeremy from the Catella team. I am here today to talk to you about uh, first two usability improvements to the host details UI around content views. Uh, and then I'll be moving on to some changes we're making to the default enablement of custom products. Um, yeah. OK, so uh, first improvement that I was going to talk about here is around uh, changing a host's content view. Um, and this actually came out of a post on our community support board. Uh, a user was trying to change the content view of a host and uh, didn't understand uh, how to do it because the content view dropdown actually wasn't there. Um, and the reason for that is because the, the content view dropdown was hidden uh, until you select an environment. Uh, so the change we've made now is that the dropdown is visible but disabled, and it has some helper text here to tell you what you need to do. So uh, we changed this both on this page here that you're looking at, the change content source page, and on the host details page. Um, so here, once uh, once you select a content source, you must then select an environment. It tells you that. And once you select an environment, now finally you can select a content view. So that's the first improvement. Uh, next, we have to the content view card on the host details page. Uh, so normally when you change a host content view, the, um, you know, the errata and package info are not updated immediately. They're gonna be out of date for up to four hours until the next host check-in or package action. Um, and so we've added this checkbox here. You can see we've added the same uh, Right here, we've added this checkbox here to, so that you can choose to update the host immediately via remote execution. And what that will do is, if I check this box, it will start a remote execution job along with the content view change. And when that job completes, um, all this is doing is running this command subscription manager repos on the host. When it completes, it should update this errata chart and uh, Last check in immediately. Let me go see why this failed. This was happening to me this morning, too. Anyway, if remote execution were working, it would update this immediately. Let me try restarting my server and see if we can do this again.
while we're waiting for that, I will tell you. That when you update your when you update your host um, when you update the package profile your clickable errata may not change but your installable errata will change okay i've got my server started back up again let's see if we can get it to work We're waiting for the Webpack bundle. It should be just a few more seconds. Come on, Webpack. Let's see how our smart proxy is doing here. Uh, we're green, okay. We should be able to try it again. Okay, so we change the content view. I forgot to check the box. OK, now we're starting the remote execution job again. Let's see if it works the second time around. Sorry for the delay, everyone. This doesn't work the second time. I'm just going to move on and uh, make you imagine it. But oh no, this time it worked. OK, so we see our installable errata went to 0 because this content view is empty. And our last check-in is now 11 seconds ago. Uh, and that's because we ran this remote execution job on the host that allowed the host to update immediately. So hopefully, those will be some nice improvements for uh, users around changing content views. Uh, I want to stop there briefly and see if there are any questions. I don't know if there's any questions in the YouTube chat. No, indeed. Yeah, there aren't. But also, the bad news is that the sound doesn't work for the YouTube live chat. So, yeah. Oh, OK. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, we're recording this. So yeah, don't worry. Everyone will see it just after we're finished here. But I don't see any questions. I had one question, Jeremy. Uh, are there plans to implement this for bulk actions? Is this allowed in a bulk action updating content source, content views? Um, the, uh, the remote execution job where you can update the host immediately was not implemented for bulk actions. Um, I think there may be a consideration with that uh, because you're going to have all sorts of simultaneous requests to subscription manager if it were a bulk action. Um, and if you're doing it on hundreds of hosts, you might as well wait until they check in anyway. Um, so yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't think about implementing it for bulk. If that's something that community members are clamoring for, we will certainly consider it though. OK, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's OK to move on, I'm going to move to the second part of my presentation. Definitely. Um, oh, yeah. You know what? I'm going to change the content view back so that you can actually see content on this host. Look at this. So convenient. It's going to update right away.
Okay, so uh, moving on, I want to talk about the um, the big change here, and that is uh, a change to custom product enablement. So going back to going back to some Catello basics here, if I have a host and I want to give it access to my content, but not all my content, what do I do? There's there's several ways Catello offers uh, to restrict access to content for a host. There's content views, lifecycle environments, uh, a couple other things you can do. Uh, but within the context of uh, custom products, especially uh, before simple content access, in the before times, one of the main ways that people uh, would restrict access to content was simply not to subscribe to that content. Uh, so if you don't if you don't attach a subscription to your host, you don't have access to the content from that host. And the typical experience when you add a new custom product to your system is that your host doesn't have access to it unless you take some action. Uh, you either attach a subscription to the host or you attach a subscription to the activation key uh, so that it does it for you. Um, however, simple content access is now the default for new organizations and it will soon become the only way to do things. So now what happens with respect to custom products when you turn on simple content access? Uh, well, right now, two things happen. First, the host gets access to content regardless of subscription. Uh, so you recall custom products are enabled by default now. That's, that's what this is here. So a bunch of custom products you didn't have subscriptions for may suddenly pop up when you turn on SCA. You might not want that to happen. Secondly, when you add a new custom product, all hosts immediately get access to it because you no longer need to attach subscriptions and custom products are enabled by default. So those are those are two things that happen that you might not want to happen uh, with SCA and custom products. And we tried to mitigate this a little bit by adding like OS version and architecture restrictions uh, and a couple other things. But over the past couple of years, we've realized this isn't really enough. And the fact is that enabled is just kind of a bad default for custom products when you're using SCA. So what we did is we decided to flip the default to disabled. That's right, custom products will now be disabled by default starting in Catello 4.9. Uh, but we have to do this in a smart way, right? So if I upgrade my Catello or if I turn on simple content access, as a user, I expect my access to content to not change suddenly. I expect it to remain exactly the same as it was before I upgraded. So when we built this, we were given a constraint that flipping this default should not change existing hosts access to content. So the way we did that is during this upgrade to Catello 4.9, there's a task that runs, uh, we call it a upgrade rake task, but it doesn't matter. It's going to run automatically. There's nothing you have to do. And uh, this task will first add content overrides so that your access to content doesn't change. And uh, by content overrides, what I mean is you can see the status of custom products here. Um, by the way, we've added this drop down so that you can filter to just custom products. Um, and you can see I've, I've just run the task while I've been talking here. And you can see that these overrides were added for me. Um, this is what I call an enabled override. Um, and there's there's also disabled overrides. You can add them just here by override to disabled, override to enabled, and then reset to default. Uh, so what the task does is for non-SCA orgs, for any organization for which you do not have simple content access turned on, it's going to add disabled overrides for all hosts and activation keys for any content that you don't have a subscription for. Now, you may be wondering why add a disabled override if the new default is going to be disabled. Uh, because the second step is, and this is what you're seeing here, to add enabled overrides for any custom content that doesn't already have an override. And that applies to all hosts and activation keys in all organizations. And only then do we actually flip the default to disabled. So this, this may be hard to get your head around, but when all is said and done, your host access to content will remain the same because of these overrides you're adding, uh, that we're adding rather. So in all of your organizations, you're going to see lots of these content overrides for your existing custom products. 
but the result of these overrides will be that your host's access to content will remain the same as it was before the upgrade. The effect for non-simple content access orgs is you'll be able to turn on simple content access without host access to content changing. And again, that's because of these overrides. And for all your activation keys, you'll be able to continue using the same activation keys to give host access to the same content as before. Uh, so now going forward, when you add a new custom product, it'll be disabled by default. This applies to both hosts and activation keys. You'll now need to override to enabled if you want to give access to that content. So it's, it's the opposite of what you had to do before. Likewise, if you choose to remove one of the overrides, we'll reset to default on this now, you'll see that it returns to its default state of disabled. And I can do that all of them here. And now my default is disabled. So a couple things to keep in mind, this default enablement change only affects custom products. It does not affect Red Hat products. And uh, the change is intended to make things easier for SCA users, but it applies to all users and all orgs, both SCA and non-SCA. So changing defaults, it always has the chance of upsetting someone, but on balance, we think this is a better default. And as always, feedback is welcome and here for any questions. Thanks. Thanks, Jeremy. Currently, I haven't seen questions, but let's give it a minute. And the good news is that uh, YouTube and uh, sound is now fixed. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, I do see a question from Lou Morel here on the Google Meet chat. As I have remembered, is Ubuntu Debian already ready for that? I only remember a message from months back that there were issues with Subscription Manager and SCA on them. Um, I don't know if I am the right person to answer that, but like theoretically content overrides should work the same on Debian as they do on, on RHEL. Um, I know they are doing some work on the host details page for Debian and simple content access. But yeah, I, I don't really know the state of that. I might ask the, uh, the ATIX folks. Um, okay, can we move on to the next topic? Let's see. Yeah, if there's no more questions, thanks. Yeah, one last check on the YouTube uh, channel. I don't see any questions. And also on, on IRC, everything is clear. Um, so Ian, I guess you're the next one with the topic of installable Ereta option in report template. That sounds good. I'll get my screen shared. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Hello there, everyone. Um, so my demo today is a bit of a report template update. So we have a couple of report templates that show um, errata that are applicable to the system. Um, Jeremy mentioned that word a few times in his previous demo. Just for a reminder, applicable means that um, a certain erratum or package could be copied into your host's content view version, but it doesn't necessarily exist there. So if it's applicable but not installable, that means you have to do an incremental update, and then you can patch your host. Um, whereas installable means your host right away should be able to yum update that package. So our templates, our, our reports before showed applicable, but it never showed things that are directly installable, and now that's changed. So I have a host here, my uh, Catello client, and I have an erratum that's applicable but not installable. So I'll just show here uh, how that will look on the report. Um, so two reports changed, the applicable errata report and then the registered content host report. I'll just show real quick what the code looks like. So 
we have a new input called installability that you can set to true or false, or no, not true or false, sorry, applicable or installable. Um, and then in the code, we use that input to load uh, one of two methods. If it's applicable, we, we load the host applicable errata, and if it's installable, we load the host installable errata. So I'll show you what this looks like from a generation. So first I'll generate the applicable from the, uh, I'll do HTML so it's easier to read. And let me get this in my browser. So here we go. This should look familiar. We have information about the applicable erratum. Now, if we go back to the report, and I'm going to change it to installable, you should see that the report will be completely empty because that host has no installable errata. And moving the file over, we see it's completely empty. So only your installable errata will show up here. So we have another report as well that got changed. This is the host registered content hosts report. This is a bit different in that it, as part, uh, for each host, it shows a list of all the applicable errata IDs. So again, it's the same installability field. If you choose the installability to be applicable, um, it will load the hosts, use this um, method host latest applicable RPM version, um, and then, or sorry, that's for the kernel, my bad. Um, so there's, yeah, there are two things that change. So firstly, for the errata list, we reload either the applicable errata IDs or the installable errata IDs. Um, we also show the latest kernel. So if your current, if you choose to show applicable content, will load your kernel if it's applicable. However, if you choose installable only content, if your kernel is not installable, we're not going to show it here. So that's the filtering that we're doing. Um, so let me generate this report and just show you what it looks like. So first, I'll start with applicable like last time. And here's the report. So I only have a single host. So you'll see the applicable errata field has this errata minute right here. I don't have any kernel updates needed, so this is empty. Now if we go back and if we change that to installable errata, you'll see that no errata will pop up. So let's change this to installable. I'll keep it HTML. All right, and here we go. So you see now it says no installable errata and still no latest kernel version because there are none. Um, so this report could be this report change could be helpful depending on the situation you're looking for. If you truly just need to know what updates are required on a machine, I would recommend sticking with applicable because that will always show you what your host needs. However, if you're really just interested in knowing what your host can actually update to, I would filter in the installability part. So it kind of depends on what you want. Do you need to know every single time that your host is missing a security patch? Or do you just need to know, you know, can you maybe for some reason you can't perform that incremental update? And in that case, then you can use installability. And that is all from me. Uh, are there any questions? Um, let's see. So IRC is clear, YouTube is clear, and also here. Um, yeah, so I guess no more questions. Maybe someone has questions about the previous topic. It can also be the time to ask. And if not, we'll move on to the next one. And 
see. Okay, and the next one is a Catello update. Okay, we have a new release by Lucy. Yeah. Give me a screen. So Catello 4.8 release is around the corner. Its announcement is coming next week. There are two features added in this version. The first feature is incremental content exports in SQL format for inter-server synchronization. And Pata uh, adding new support. All three export options are available for incremental con content export. The second feature is register hosts to multiple content views. Jeremy studied this feature, and this feature is still in its early stage, so you won't see many changes in UI yet. To register hosts to multiple content views, you have to use certain version of subscription manager to register a host on real eight. And other than the two features, there are over 70 bug fixes coming with the release. Uh, you can check the details in the change log file. That's for Catano 4.8 release. Uh, my next presentation is for a change in content, a change in change content source. Let me show you how it looks like before the fix. So here, uh, in case you have like multiple uh, organizations, if you select the content source and then in the environment, you will see multiple library entries for each organization. That's the old page. This is how the new page looks like. Uh, it, it uses a React component for environment content view selector. That's used also by the content view detail card that Jeremy just demoed earlier. So here we also have multiple uh, organizations here. We select the content source, but here you only see the environments coming from this organization. So you won't see uh, the other, you won't see the, the uh, environments from other kind from other organizations. That's all I have. Okay, thank you, Lucy. Um, yeah, so I haven't seen any questions. Let's check, yeah, all clear. Um, so I guess we can move on to our next topic, which is by Samir. Uh, store CV version applied filters. Okay, so let me present my screen here. All right, so I have two topics to go over today. Uh, both are around content views. So the first thing I'll go over is a new flag that we have added to content views. So let me go over what I have in terms of data here. So I have a content view with some repositories added, and I haven't published a version yet. So what that means is to use this content view, you first need to publish it so that you can basically grab that access to other hosts. So the new field that we can check is called cv.needs publish true. So this is true right now because I haven't published any versions. So let me publish this. And All right, so I have my new version right now. Let's look at doing to do. Okay. 
Lui. Ok. Uh, there seems to be some issue here. It should. Am I on the right branch? Let me see. Sorry. Yes. I'm on the right now. Oh, I might be looking at the default organization. Sorry about that. So this is content view two. All right, yeah, so this is the one that should be looking at. Minute is two. Interesting. Okay, there seems to be some issue here. Okay, uh, let me look at this and maybe I can do this in the next demo. And we can probably move on to the second part of my demo, which was around filters so if you notice this content view so i have this version one and this only has four packages one errata but if i look at what repositories are added here this has a bunch of content so it had like a lot of packages a lot of errata which did not make it to this version so looking at this version that tells me that filters were applied so in this current state i can go look at all the filters that were applied so for example i had a filter to include just one single package and i also have an errata filter which is filter two which also has one errata by id added to filter out of that version so what we have added is basically a field on the content view version. So let me touch that. Version and this ID is two. we have added here is a new field called applied filters on the content view version itself so what that does is captures the state of filters that were applied to this version and so you can see this is a json and it has applied filters with captures which is an array of all the filters and it captures the rules so you can see this is the rpm filter i had which was filtering based on name catalog agent. And you can look at the affected repositories. Affected repositories is basically what repositories that filter will apply to. So in case you don't have any setup on your filter, so where you do that is here. So this says apply to all repositories in the content view. So this list will be all repositories in your content view. And this is the second rule. So here you can see it's an errata rule. So it stores the errata ID. And how that helps us is basically we don't store the versions for filters. So if I were to go here and add a new RPM rule, let's say Ansible, and add this, the new version that I publish will have applied filters which are in the updated state. So if I go back and look, try to figure out what was the state of filters when version one was published, that is where this comes handy. Uh, all right, and 
that was all I had. Sorry about the previous demo around needs publish. I will look at that and get back to you folks. No Thanks. problem. Yeah, looking forward to seeing in the next demo. Um, okay, let's see if we have any questions. So if not, we can move on to our last topic. Okay, YouTube is clear. Also, IRC, also um, the Google chat here is clear. Okay, so I guess we can move on to our next topic, um, which will be presented by Gerija. Um, and okay, I won't tell you more about it. I want Gerija to tell you about basically socket chart feature. Is it needed? Gerija, whenever you're ready, I think uh, you're good to go. Um, yeah, thanks, Nufar. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Girija, and I'm a software engineer in the Team Rocket. Uh, so today, I wanted to get your opinion on the importance of Socket Chat feature. So basically, we had a little ambiguity with the existence of Socket Chat feature. Uh, it started when a bug got reported, which indicated that the feature was broken. I'll just share my screen, and I'll show you uh, how the broken feature looks like. So. As you can see, uh, this is a screenshot that, what, that, that was attached in the bug. And uh, so basically, the steps to reproduce this is when we select monitor, and then we select fax, and then we search for LSCPU socket, the chart that gets displayed isn't rendered correctly. As you can see uh, in the screenshot, uh, it only renders seven out of eight fields. So basically, the review suggested that instead of fixing the chart, we can drop the chart because of lack of feedback and functionality and the importance of the chart. Uh, it also suggested that the feature is like a nice to have feature, but it might not be very reliable as expected, or it is not required as much. So I wanted to get your opinion. Do you think we should drop the feature? If not, should we consider keeping the feature? So uh, I have added a post in the community chat. I'll just share the link in the chat. So as you can see, this is the post that I've added. And um, in the post, we have a poll, which is up until next Thursday. And as of now, we have three votes that suggest to drop it, like it just to drop the feature. Uh, but also, we would love to get your feedback on the same. You can tell me now, or you can comment on the post or vote on the poll. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Gerija. Thank you for this um, this poll and this uh, topic that uh, can be very helpful if you share uh, your feedback with us, if you need this feature. If not, maybe you have, uh, other topics in mind you want to share with us regarding this. Currently, I don't see any questions or, yeah, all clear. Um, okay, so this was our last topic for today. And the next demo is on May 4th. Um, and if there are, aren't any more questions, I guess that concludes our demo for today. So uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation and seeing with what's new with Foreman. And yeah, we look forward to seeing you again next time.